I hope before today you've taken a moment to read about Nancy Dubuque on the posters that we've had throughout the comm building. I'll repeat some of those highlights um, for the parents and guests here. Nancy is the president and CEO of the A&E Networks, was the Arts and Entertainment Networks. By some measures, it's the most successful of all cable networks. You may know the A&E Networks by its programs. If you're older like me, it's, um, it was the History Channel. It was so often identified as the place where black and white newsreels were constantly in play. Some people used to joke it was the all Hitler channel all the time. So much World War II was going on there. Um, but that was pre-Nancy, or at least before Nancy took charge. And um, Nancy believes that history is found in many different places. And now the uh, a and &E network is home to such shows as there's Ice Road Truckers, you may have seen, Duck Dynasty, um, Hatfields and McCoys, a feature film, uh, Pawn Stars. I have to be careful when I say pawn, not porn, so it's Pawn Stars, so you know uh, what it's all about. And many, many more programs like that truly transformed the, uh, the network and really has made it one of the most exciting uh, networks on television now. The Hollywood Reporter, which covers the entertainment industry, they did their uh, recent uh, issue and they listed the 100 most powerful women in the field of entertainment. And Nancy was listed number three of the 100 most powerful women in the whole world of entertainment. I'm higher than Oprah, so, by the way. It's, uh, you know, you want to talk about a, uh, a, a knock-your-socks-off resume, and uh, she brings that uh, to us today. But she's the antithesis of that I, 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 look at me world. She's really all about working with others and building the we not the me, something that she may have learned as a rower on the women's crew team when she was here at BU. If you speak uh, with military veterans, for example, about the A&E network, they're likely to describe it as the network that strongly and without public fanfare sponsors two of the most important veteran service organizations. The mission continues and Operation Rubicon. This isn't an accident. Nancy has two grandfathers who were veterans of World War II and honoring those who serve the country means much to her. And she formally mentors younger women professionals just as she was mentored, passing it forward. And she makes spending time with her children a top priority. One of her children is here with us today. So uh, we're proud of all that Nancy has accomplished and we're basking in her professional success, but we're even more proud of that non-resume that Nancy brings and the example that she has set. So class of 2015 and parents, family, and friends, it's a true pleasure to introduce Nancy Dubuque, College of Communication, class of 1991. Thank you, thank you. And in, uh, an important lesson for all of you and for Dean Fiedler, do not believe your own press. So the faster you learn that, the more successful you will be, I guarantee you. Dean Fiedler, distinguished faculty, parents, family, friends, and most importantly, the class of 2015. Thank you. Thank you for welcoming me back to Boston University. And if we're being honest, the chances of me speaking here today weren't much different than the chances of me actually graduating here 24 years ago. So I want to thank everyone who made both honors possible and a special shout out to Professor Cakebread who really got me across that line. I, I am both humbled and grateful, but most of all, I am so proud of this class. I read that a record 42,000 people apply to be in the class of 2015, which made me think two things. <clears throat> Excuse me, under no circumstances would I have been accepted in the class of 2015. And this is one of the smartest, most accomplished group of men and women to ever come through this school. You have so much going for you right now.
You're graduating at a time when there have never been more opportunities for innovation and reinvention in the ways that we communicate and entertain. More than any previous generation, revolutions in technology today have given all of you a greater chance to shape your own destiny and most importantly, write your own story. And on top of that, you got to live in Boston when the Red Sox and the Patriots won a championship. Woo! That's about as good as it gets. So I could go on and on about how great you have it. I could keep flattering you and saying that unlike those kids in Chestnut Hill who tell, you, tell people they went to school in Boston, you are actually telling the truth, so congratulations. But I also know that right now you're probably saying to yourself, when's the Duck Dynasty lady going to stop talking? I'm tired, I'm hungover, I'm just going to say it, Dean, it's hungover, and I just want to graduate. So I hear you, I've been there, and in order not to break the cardinal rule of commencement speeches, which is brevity, I won't spend any more talk time talking about what you've accomplished. I want to talk about what you might be afraid of. The first thing you're probably a little afraid of right now is the future, I would guess. And that's completely understandable. What comes next is new, it's different, it's unknown, and I'll tell you right now, it is not in your control. Long ago, my stepfather, Brendan Smith, gave me one of the best pieces of advice I have ever received. Don't worry about it, that Nancy, because it's not going to turn out that way anyway. At times, I found that advice supremely annoying, but mostly, I found it liberating. I realized that we can neither control nor predict with certainty the outcome of every decision that we make. And it taught me to learn something very important, trust my gut. So don't spend too much time worrying about what the future holds, because it's not going to turn out that way anyway. The second thing you might be afraid of right now, and in my opinion, the most limiting and the most important, is thinking you have to start making choices that earn other people's approval. The other day, I came across a t-shirt in Forever 21 that said, I did it for the likes. I did it for the likes. Six words that sum up so much of what's influencing our culture today we have become a like culture, running the risk of constantly seeking affirmation. And in an age of social media that provides an instant thumbs up or thumbs down, it's easy to get caught in this endless feedback loop of approval and disapproval. So be mindful that as a generation of influencers, which you are, a like culture can easily extend beyond social media to the life choices we make, looking for that affirmation of, yes, your idea is good, yes, your career path is acceptable, and yes, your achievement is good enough. Now, I know what some of you may be thinking, this woman is in television where the whole point of the business is people liking things. But, yes, that's true. It's also true that I have never come across a hit show that wasn't first mocked, or dismissed or outright rejected in meeting after meeting. Imagine for a minute the decision-making process that led to putting a show on the air, truckers on ice driving 15 miles an hour on the History Channel. <laughs> and my personal favorite, imagine the, how well the pitch went for a show about a family of four guys with long beards who make duck calls. Duck Dynasty at its height was bigger than American Idol. Don't get me wrong, you should listen to, and whenever possible, try to learn from other people's opinions and suggestions, and you should surround yourself with people who will challenge you in a healthy way and who will help you grow. But it's important to make decisions after digesting people's points of view. Be open-minded to other people's experiences, opinions, and criticisms, but don't allow their perspective to define you. Don't allow what others think might be best for you to limit you. And don't allow your gut and your instinct to be silenced. The first major decision I made based on the same advice that I'm giving you today was right here at BU. And it was one of the most difficult of my life at that time. 
When I originally came to BU, I made a mental list of all of the jobs that society deemed acceptable and things I could understand, lawyer, banker, accountant, so I made my way to the School of Management. No, not woo. <laughs> no, we don't like that. Yes, it made my parents happy, and I quickly realized it made me miserable. So I switched to comm because I knew I was drawn to the ADD world of news and entertainment. And yes, my parents had some questions. My parents, who I love and respect more than anyone whose opinion I deeply value, wondered how switching to comm would work. What would I do? And yet, despite their hesitation, I decided to stick with my gut. I stuck with calm. Woo! <laughs> and it's the only reason that I am standing here today. Pitching to my parents taught me that you have to have a clear point of view. It's OK if people don't agree with your point of view, but you have to be thoughtful about your choices and make them your own. I'm here today because I learned to trust my own instincts and my own judgment. I learned to carefully listen to others and to trust myself, and that freed me to be fearless in the choices that I made, to accept that some of the choices will lead to success and some will lead to failure. The real test of fearlessness is not about bucking the system, and this is important. It's about how you respond to failure. And if you're truly fail fearless, you will fail and you will grow from it. I will humbly admit I was either a bit naive or fearless to walk into the History Channel for the first time and say, hey, is there a reason we only do black and white shows about Hitler? What if we made present tense shows about things people wanted to watch? A lot of blank stares that day, a lot of responses to the tune of, well, that's not how we do it here. True. But the safe, boring route was designed to gain everyone's approval. It had given us a network that was probably had being watched by more people than we had, more viewers than we had employees. So again, I had to trust my own instincts. I put shows on the air that I wanted to watch myself. I had to learn to be fearless in the face of people who didn't approve of my choices. A sampling of some reviews of my early shows have received over the years, wildly graceless, an imbalanced mess, and my personal favorite, everything that's wrong with America today. <laughs> and those were the successful shows that won awards and resonated with viewers millions and millions and millions of times over. For every Ice Road Truckers or Pawn Stars, and yes, it was called that way on Deliberate, Dean Fiedler, there were other shows that didn't work out. You've never heard of Jurassic Fight Club, and I still can't believe that a show with a tagline, Are You the Toughest Dinosaur, didn't work out. Um, and there was my biggest setback. Shortly after I took over the History Channel, I decided to champion our first scripted series, an eight-part mini about the Kennedy family. We had big writers, big actors, an even bigger budget. And after weeks of controversy, we decided not to air it. It was the most expensive show the network had ever made. And I was pretty sure that my decision to green light it meant that I, too, was about to be history. As I was still trying to shake off this disappointment, another project got on my radar, actually one that had been rejected for the past 15 years by other networks. It was another mini with big actors and a big budget and another American epic family. My colleagues asked me if I was crazy. Are you sure this is the right idea? Are you sure that now is the right time? Maybe it's best to lay low for a little while. They had a point. I had just failed publicly and spectacularly. And there was part of me that didn't want to risk any more humiliation that could have cost me my job, but really, more importantly, my reputation. But my instinct still said that this one could be different. This one I believe in. And despite all that had happened, despite all of the dislikes that I had racked up, I decided to trust my instinct and go for it. And before I knew it, I was drinking a beer in a seedy bar in LA with Kevin Costner, where he agreed to help me make Hatfields and McCoys, a series that ended up winning 
five Emmys, two Golden Globes, and some of the highest ratings in cable TV history. And my point is this, thank you. My, my point is this, in my field and in others, the most successful people that I've come across are not the people who have failed the least. They are the people who have failed the most and who have bounced back from that failure the fastest. They're the people who don't let rejection define them, who outlast and persevere through 50 no's just to hear the one yes. So when you inevitably keep when you inevitably fail, keep moving forward, be humble, ask yourself what you learned. Don't allow the voice of self-doubt to get too loud because trusting your instincts is most difficult when everyone else is questioning them. And I know that this is easier said than done. I live in this like culture too, and even for me, it's a powerful force. After years of practice with disapproval, and failure, there are still times when I care too much about what other people think. We are, in fact, human. In those moments, I try to remember that innovation can be lonely, as it sometimes requires the bold thinking and courageous action that groupthink cannot support. And as BU graduates, your fellow alums include the first American woman to earn a PhD, the first woman admitted to the bar in Massachusetts, the country's first black psychiatrist, and its first popularly elected black senator. Alexander Graham Bell was a BU faculty member when he conducted his experiments on a strange new concept, the phone. Imagine all of the people who doubted these pioneering giants. Imagine all of the people who disliked their decisions and disapproved of their dreams. But they didn't listen to those voices. They listened to their own. And we are all better off for it and their choices. So make sure your choices reflect your talents, your hopes, your passions, and your very best instincts. As I shared at the outset, I believe there are more opportunities than ever for this class to forge its own path Every one of you can tailor a career around your unique interests and skills. And don't be afraid to spend some time figuring it all out, because the end result will be a life that is much more satisfying than anything that others can plan. So class of 2015, my challenge to you is harder than you may think. I am daring you to trust your own instincts. Dare to lead when others want you to follow. Dare to be bold when others feel fear. And dare to fail greatly and graciously. And just when you think you have it all figured out, you will have to dare to do it all over again. And please do me one last favor before I sit. Lay off the like button. Savor this day, you have earned it. Congratulations and thank you.